Um, welcome, everybody, th to the second session on uh, tonight. And uh, we've got an amazing panel tonight. Just a, a bit of housekeeping. So we're live on YouTube. So um, obviously, um, you know, kind of all the things that come with that. So um, uh, I also just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Robert Blakelock. I'm chairing tonight and I'm very lucky to have this amazing crew. And what I, so the format is we're going to have about sort of 40 minutes of panel discussion and then um, uh, I'm going to open it up. Anybody who wants to make a comment on YouTube to ask a question, please do so. And then uh, we'll go through those and take questions from the floor. Um, so um, this session is about uh, storytelling in all the best ways. And it's also trying to, de if it's even possible, demystifying how you take uh, an idea, a story, a work and put it onto the page and then the screen and all the challenges that it comes with. And it's, uh, it's a really interesting um, uh, set of challenges and we're lucky to have some brilliant people here this morning. So um, Simon, I'm just going to probably butcher, you know, kind of your, your, yeah, your, your <laughs> story. Um, but so, so Simon Ashdown, uh, a pr producer, scriptwriter, esteemed uh, uh, Storyteller was series consultant for eight years on EastEnders, mm -hmm. uh, but it has a really unusual, uh, you know, kind of breadth of experience. Uh, I think you won four BAFTAs for its EastEnders and collectively. Yeah, a few. Yeah. A small <laughs> one. Um, <laughs> but um, we, we'll, we'll talk about some of the things things that you're working on uh, currently. But sure. but um, and there's a long list of credits, but. But, but, you know, how do you describe what you do to when people ask you what you do for a living? Well, I suppose I'd, I'd, I'd start mainly saying a, a writer, really, a screenwriter, yeah. because, I mean, that's the essential... That's the essential thing that I do, or how I define myself. But I think it's quite... It's quite hard to... And, and I suppose another thing I do, which has come off my experience, is being a kind of serious consultant, which is working on other people's shows and helping make them better in terms of focusing on the storytelling but I think if you after a while if you're a screenwriter I think now in this climate you want to be a kind of um a kind of writer producer because really to try and get what you feel the show should be onto the screen and that's um a much more complicated process where from right from the beginning you know when you're trying to sell the idea and and get the idea commissioned to when it's green lit to then put in the, the show together and then seen it through the shoot and then the post-production. And there's, there's you know, a lot to talk about, I think, in terms of yeah. all those aspects, but in a way that all aspects of writing, because if you're a novelist and you're describing a character or describing the way a character dresses, you know, if you're a screenwriter, you want to try and make sure that you're working with really talented people who bring their vision to it as well, but you capture the essence of that character in the way they're dressed or the way they look or the way their room is. And mm. So it's, it's, it's a kind of, you're a writer, but you're working in a visual medium. So, you know, you think, you think, I mean, the reason I'm writing scripts and not novels is I kind of think more in terms of pictures. That's how I just automatically right, right, do it. Right. Um, well, so you want to find, you want to ensure that that kind of like gets on the screen, yeah. sorry. But it, no, we'll come back to the, because yeah, yeah. there's so many mechanical elements to it as well as the emotional and the, you know, kind of the, the, the internal world that you have to build. But so, so Jenny, we'll come to you. Jenny is uh, what, what they call in, in Hollywood a multi-hyphenate. Oh. So, um, you, uh, I mean, I think it's, it, it's uh, you know, uh, a uh, really august set of credits working from, uh, you know, kind of the, 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 the long continuing drama, uh, uh, Holby, EastEnders, um, Casualty even. Um, and then you have had this... Um, uh, kind of brilliant mentorship to other writers um, and uh, uh, been a producer and now you are uh, what has been described as a, as a story hornet for Phoebe Waller-Bridge. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, and that's really really um, uh, fascinating because I think that breadth of experience from from uh, sort of the most uh, kind of intimate stuff in, in, in people's living rooms to the kind of biggest storytelling. And we'll do a deep dive into that. But t t t how do you describe what you do? 
<clears throat> well, I always feel that I, I sort of end up... I, I mean, I, I help writers, I suppose, is what I do. That's what I like doing. My, my favourite part of, of working on any, any of the shows I've worked on, whether they're the long runners or, or now, has been working with writers. And that's, you know, I've always... Even if I've... Things I've been lucky enough to produce, I've always wanted to be there at the, at the writing side of it as well and the storytelling side of it and the storylining side of it because that's the bit that always interests me the most and I think that's where that's where it all happens. It all happens in that stage of the script and it doesn't matter how much money you throw at it at the end or how brilliant the cast is, the, the really important part is, is the beginning and the, and the storytelling and the finding the characters and the, and the doing the script. So I've, I've always tried to um, stay doing that, which sometimes is quite hard because I think some producers do then go off and be more about the production and um, and not so involved in the um, not so involved in the early stages, and I've sort of tried to find my way back to always doing that. And I, you know, I just love working with writers. Um, I, I asked a quite challenging question to Don, who I'll introduce earlier. I said, "What does a producer actually do?" So we'll, we'll think about that for later. <laughs> but so so Don, for the, anybody who wasn't here at the earlier panel, is uh, you know a brilliant young producer. His uh, first feature's just been. Um, uh, long listed for the uh, well, he's been long listed for the Breakthrough Producer of the Year at the British Independent Film Awards, and his film uh, Bull is is available shortly to stream. Um, so, so Dom, uh, without repeating what you, <laughs> I don't mind repeating. No, no, um, but but um, so you, you know, I, I know you've been um, kind of thinking seriously about how you take material and put it on the screen. You know, how do you articulate that process for uh, people who don't who don't really, uh, you know, kind of understand all the pieces of, of getting a script to screen? Um, well, I don't think I know the answer to that really. I think I'm figuring that out myself as well. I'm I'm, I'm in the fortunate position to have a small as a uh, a new producer have a development fund, which is minimal compared to um, some of the big kids, but. From that, uh, I am <clears throat> in a position to be able to create brand new pieces of work or um, uh, option books to then turn into scripts or option scripts that already exist, which obviously the hardest thing I think from that is creating the work from scratch, um, which with my limited development funds, try, trying to make that go as far as possible. I don't want to back too many uh, dud horses that don't go anywhere because the money will just will just run out. Mm. So I'm still trying to figure out what are the ingredients of what will get made, what will people want to watch, uh, what makes good storytelling. But I think for me, it's just um, I'm drawn to compelling storytelling and characters. And, and I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm sort of genre specific mm. in the type of work that I, I would like mm. to tell. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to storytelling in Bull later, but um, um, so Simon, um, you, I, I think you said really clearly that um, you know, kind of, it's it, it, the, pro pro providing a sort of architecture of storytelling. I, is that different when you're doing it for you know, kind of multi episodes a, a week, or is it or, is it materially different if you're writing a big uh, film or or or, or, or short drama or I mean I. I haven't done film. I mean, I've done one kind of short film, but my most of my experience is TV. But I suppose there was like, yeah, I mean, a long run in television series, like a massive one like EastEnders, is like four episodes a week. I'm currently doing a four-parter. I've done another show, which is like two two hours or ten hours. You know, so there's various... But, uh, so but quick, quick question, do you, do you get to know your characters any better? When it's when it's over a year, or do you do you, do you feel like you have to build the same universe for this? Well, the, I think there's two there's two aspects. One is the storytelling, one's the characters. I think on a show like EastEnders, you kind of like you land in it. There is a world there, you know. There's a there's a set, there's characters, there's history, and the truth is like elements of each of those are really good. Like certain parts of the set are really good. Certain characters are really are really good. So it's, what you're doing really is you, as a writer, you look into that and think, what actually genuinely interests me? What aspect of a character or a really great actor hasn't been exploited? And then you make up a story from that. And usually you'd write up a story, say on eight pieces of paper, and that story would probably have the same architecture as an episode or something. A beginning, middle and end, all the same rules would apply. You want a, a protagonist that you had a really interesting dilemma, you want a really strong goal. But those eight pieces of paper are probably going to be two years. Mm. And so when you're writing that, 
I always found I'd get images for episodes. I'd suddenly think of episodes. So you'd have eight pieces of paper of maybe like, say, eight key episodes, and the end of which is going to be the end of that story, which is sometimes like a, a real-time episode or a two-hander. So that's kind of the way you think about that. And if you're then meant in like a more limited series, like a four-part or something, it's pretty much the same thing, except you've got to make up the characters. So that's a lot more work. Mm. Obviously, you get to you get to do something that is genuinely what you want to do and you can invent those characters and you can really focus on concerns that you've already got. But the essential task of the storytelling is the same thing, about making a compelling story of a four and then within the episode, it's making that. And if, you were get, if I was going to list out some key rules, rules, they would apply to any of those. It's right. all really? the same okay. thing. It's just telling stories. And, and it's interesting that thing of... of an, a pre-existing palette, which obviously, if you yeah. if you have an underlying work of a, bu a book or a long run, you know, kind of uh, for you, how, how do you use the same process when you come to something, a fresh idea or or or, or pre-existing material? Is it, is it a very different process? It's kind of uh, it's similar, but it is kind of different. I'm at the moment. I'm just we've just finished. We're just editing this four-parter, which is of a a book, a novel, which is a kind of. And it's a hybrid of a kind of dark kind of thriller and an emotional story of a marriage. So that was a book that you know I was given to read, and then I immediately saw things in it that chimed with me. So that was really important. I think if you just do it as a geek, and you don't just do it as a job, usually those things don't work out. You know, you have to find something you generally respond to, and therefore in that you're given story and character. And I would say in that case, my job is to work out what I really like about that almost take those things out, put them on the table. Like they're kind of maybe some really big key plot points, really good twists, put them there. What I like about the characters, work out the essence, put that on the table. Anything about the atmosphere or the theme, and then the rest of it just kind of push aside. Then you take these elements that you've got from the book and the heart of the book, and you re rebuild it in a dramatic form mm -hmm. for, for television, which is a different form. Yeah. But on the thing I've just worked on, I think... The, probably the key, the key tentpole elements of the plot are there in some form, but you have to kind of get to them in different ways. And the characters are there, the essence of them, but maybe you go and investigate them in a slightly different way or you slightly shift them. So you're kind of faithful to the essence, but you want to make something new of it. And, and you know, as a young person, how did you know that you wanted to be a writer? I mean, was that... Did, did that occur to you, or did it was it sort of a deliberate thing? What, what happened in your... I, I really wanted to be a writer when I was really young, right. like when I was like seven. You know, like I, like my teacher was saying, you should be a writer. So I did that, and at a certain point, I thought, oh, I don't want to do this. Right. And just stopped doing it when I was about 15 or 16. Right. And then when I kind of went to university, I really got into photography. So I got really obsessed okay. with photography. And then I rediscovered writing, and I kind of couldn't quite work out which was the best avenue, because I wanted to do both. And then I thought, well... The combination is visual storytelling. So like telling stories and pictures. And mm. initially I thought, oh well then you become a writer director. But I tried a bit of directing and that's really quite hard work. Really <laughs> so good. um you know, and it requires skills that I don't necessarily you have to be absolutely brilliant with actors yeah. and I love working with actors and uh, I love actors, but maybe not that's not <laughs> my skill. So I then I kind of write in, you know, writing visual visual storytelling. Mm. So it, kind of, it was kind of a weird little path and then it wasn't very neat, but then they kind of came together and then that felt quite right mm -hmm. to be doing that. And, and so, d so did you, I mean, the, the rules that we talked about, is, is that something you uh, had to discover by the hard yards or was that some, did, had, you, had you read a lot about that? Were you educated in a way about that? What, so I mean, that wasn't really, uh, I, and I did do a kind of, to get myself back into it, I did a kind of a, 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 an MA in screenwriting, right, right, right. which was a film school. So you got to work with filmmakers Amazing. and directors, and and there's loads of stuff you can read about it. And then now it's everywhere. Mm. You can do a course, you can read a book. The same things come up again and again. But like, I think the essential rules are pretty simple, and they go back centuries, you know, and they're fundamental principles. And they're not rules like they're going to, if you learn these, you become a great writer. But they're just the essence of storytelling, really. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because you occasionally you can write a script and sometimes they're quite hard to work out. Like, what is that character? What does a character want in that scene? Sometimes it's quite amorphous. 
And if you don't really answer that question, you think, oh, it'll be fine. You end up watching, you think, oh, it really wasn't fine. I really should have answered that question. <laughs> because you just have to answer that question. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and I think there's a really interesting book by um, David Mamet right. called On Directing, which is supposedly about film directing, but what it's really about is writing. Yeah. And he's very dogmatic, but it's a really good, all the essence of what good screenwriting is in that book, yeah. and it's about that thin, so if anyone wants to read it. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's, re it's, it's, it's really interesting, it's that it's sort of thematically this evening, is, 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 is there's a lot of mystique about it, and there's, a, you know, the earlier panel was a lot about technical stuff. And just how invisible that is to an audience. There's a lot of a lot of really hard preparation and really methodical stuff that you have to do, as well as the really really elegant emotional stuff. So it's a really I, I, it's a very rare combination of stuff. Um, we'll, we'll 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 come back and circle back on that. So 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 Jenny, um, you know, work, working with writers is a really interesting challenge. And and so what um, kind of in terms of helping people articulate stories, what, what do you think the, you know, kind of the, the, the way that you see your role as being uh, kind of, uh, you know, how, how do you see yourself, that, uh, you know, kind of helping in that complicated system? Well, I think it's been, it's been different on the different shows I've done and the different people you work with because of the personalities of writers and, and some, I mean, like Simon is a, a writer who is the most amazing storyteller and loves that side and loves the storylining and would, you know, would never, I don't know, you know, would never need my help on something like that. <laughs> That's but, <not> other, true. <laughs> but other writers are not so keen on that. And then in, in some of the early things I did, like like Casualty, I mean, that was, I was sort of just thrown in the deep end because they didn't really? have a storylining team at the time. It was, they do now, now they have thousands of people, but it was just... It was just me and three script editors and and forty episodes and I was just you know we had a we had a Hair meeting raising. we had I think we had one meeting or two days where ten writers came in and sort of gave some ideas and then I was just told to do it mm. and and that was actually but that was really really good because I just sat there and went in every weekend and just sort of wrote pages and pages of what might happen across a series you know and then obviously everyone came in and gave it lots of notes so that I and I that gave me confidence in writing story stories but I'm not a writer and I wouldn't want to be a writer and I couldn't do dialogue or anything else like that so I just like doing the story side of it but then if you other writers you know with working with Phoebe it's much more um it's just sort of we just sit in a room and talk basically and things go on post-its on the walls and quite a lot of my embarrassing stories go on post-it on the walls and end up in her shows oh. and um, oh. Um, oh. oh okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a few there's a, like like there's a bassoonist in Fleabag who is entirely based on my son and she, now she's a bit worried that he might he must never see that <laughs> there's a line in there that says it's a cry for, not an instrument it's a cry for help <laughs> um, but yes it's much more of a just yeah. a sort of chat and a brainstorm and a, well, this would be good oh wouldn't that be good and, and and it's more done like that rather than although actually when I worked with on Killing Eve because that was more of a um, a sort of genre piece that did have to be worked out story-wise yeah. and uh, that was all very sort of running quite last minute so again that was sort of me I'd, I'd send her storylines she'd send them back yeah. I'd send them to her she'd send yeah. them back and we did it that yeah. way so it's sort of different with um, with everybody yeah. I've worked with and the same with Dickensian actually on a show I did that, you know that was very much that the sort of yeah. send the stories to the writer and the writer yeah. sends them back with ideas and you just go backwards and forwards yeah. But I prefer the sitting in the room and the and the brainstorming. Yeah. I think it's probably my favourite. And and so so how does the how does the process vary when you're as sort of working on a on a, on a in a, on a film as big as the last Bond film? So, uh, No Time to Die was you know kind of there was uh, you know kind of a, a clearly a huge amount of money to put on the screen. <coughs> what, what what does that feel like and, and and to be really different to when you're you know kind of curating very intimate sort of long running drama? The, the number of times I said that was just like EastEnders, but with a very big budget, it honestly did feel exactly the same. You know, by the time that you're printing out scripts in different colours, you know, we, they, when you do script amendments and they come out in a different colour each time after the final script, and I think we reached, I, I think we reached Goldenrod. I don't know where that is on the colour chart, but it was quite far down on the amendments, and it did feel just very like, very like um, EastEnders, really. But the obviously for that, the, there was, what well, I, I. Phoebe came in as a, as a late writer, so there was already a script in existence. Um, and although we did 
we did manage to change some of the stories, but some of the stories were very much set in stone. So there was it wasn't yeah. a case of sitting there and being able to say, how about this, how about that? And there's also obviously a lot of people involved in that because it's so much money yeah. that they, they're not going to just let you take a script away and, <laughs> and come back with something yeah. totally new. So but, but what, was, what was brilliant from, from my point of view is, is sort of seeing the effect that you and Phoebe had on, the, on putting sort of the emotional content into that. Because yeah. of, quite often it's schematic on those big big features, but it was, you know, that had a rare resonance that, that um, you know, kind of, and, and how, you know, how, how difficult is it to keep that in a big, big movie like that? Well, I think, I mean, that was her big thing. And, and because it, it was obviously going to be in um, the whole, the storyline wasn't a very emotional story and was going to have an emotional ending. She wanted to make sure that the build up to that was, um, was there because otherwise, it, you know, that, that would have been thrown away. So, so that was the, her, her sort of big challenge and more you know although it, it gets reported that she was there to sort of you know make the female characters more interesting which it, it wasn't that wasn't really the deal the deal was that she worked on the whole script and looked at the at the whole script um and i think it you know everyone was incredibly supportive of that and really i knew that that was what was missing and what probably had been missing before and also i think everyone went into that knowing that it was daniel craig's last one everyone wanted a, a an emotional um big ending for him and he is very involved in those scripts as well. And um, so he was very much part of those conversations and he was very behind having Phoebe in there. So actually it was, it was quite easy, I think, to keep those, to keep those things in. What, what was harder was to keep, to keep the funny lines in because it was a very long film and, and inevitably yeah. the, the humour and the stuff that doesn't actually push the story forward ends up being the first thing to go, which is a, which is a shame, but otherwise it would have gone on for five hours. So. Yeah. And and so when you when you're sort of doing the the, the, the long hard yards in, in in sort of casualty, do you do you ever think one day I'm going to be at the Emmys? Is that no? I never thought that. God, I mean, no. <laughs> I think I was uh, I was quite excited when I got to go with doctors to the sort of Birmingham RTS awards. That was, yeah. <laughs> that, was that was a highlight. I mean, I sort of oh, no, I never thought I'd ever yeah. go to. And also when I started in television, you know, the sort of the idea of doing something that would be in America or based in America or have American financing was mm. totally that was never going to happen. I mean, if you you know if you you were you were on a BBC budget, I was I predominantly worked for the BBC, and you were never you know that was that was you would just never even think about mm. something like that. Well, it's a, it's a really interesting ob ob observation because we, you know, we've got 100 years of the BBC next year and, uh, and we're all so used to drinking, sleeping, breathing this culture. But I think that sort of really bold storytelling that we've, we've all have grown up with is quite new in the streaming age to go everywhere in the globe. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a really interesting evolution. We'll come back to that. And, and um, Dom... Um, Can I just say one thing? So I've worked with Jenny as a writer, like on EastEnders, but on other projects since. And I would ju I'm not just saying this, but, but it's actually, it's really hard to find people that you really, really enjoy working with as writers. And I would say every writer that has worked with Jenny absolutely loves working with her. Because she's Everybody just got... loves Jenny anyway. No, but she's yeah. just got this great... No, but it's important to say she's got this great mix of being, you know, really talented, great at story, but you never feel she wants to take it over and has some other agenda and wants to make it her story. She just wants to make the story good. And that's a really rare quality, I think. And, uh, you know, I think that's, it's really important for writers. I mean, they just absolutely love that. And it's uh, not everyone does that. She just hides the fact I want to take it over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, that's true. I mean, she's realised. Come on, Jenny, now you have to be nice like Simon. Come on, be nice. I know, I, I think my writer's handling, I agree. I mean, I've had a great, you know, great time. Is that the best you can do? Yeah. <laughs> um, there are some writers who are very nervous, though. Of me. Of people, of script editors and people who yeah. are handing it over. They can be very protective of their babies. Yeah. And when somebody else comes in and starts, sometimes it can be a bit of a... But I think that's the central challenge, isn't it? Because in, in, in the end, you're going to be on the floor with maybe 500 or 1,000 people, particularly on a Bond film. And, you know, kind of keeping that, keeping that essence of, you know, kind of I, I, I hold the story and, and being able to kind of realise that you'll have to hand over to someone who, else who's going to try and translate it in the way they see it. Um, but that is actually what I think part of my job has always been as well, is protecting the writer. Because yeah. that's why I do really passionately feel that the script has to be protected. And it can... And it can get lost, and it can get lost in the silliest things like costume and well, casting yeah. obviously huge, but it can be small things, you know. And really? that, if you if there's someone there who's always defending, if they, you know, if you really care about the script and you've been part of it as almost as much as the writer, then then you will always defend that, and that's. It's I about think, trust, useful. isn't it? Yeah, and that's why I was saying earlier about is even as a writer, you almost need to be a producer as well, 
Because yeah. it's quite painful. Because wow. mm. you're trying, I mean, it really is. You're trying to protect this thing you spent ages on, you really love. And there's so many things. It's, it's casting, it's deciding who's going to produce it and mm. direct it. And co- you say costume. Yeah, and if you don't have right, a producer like, credit as a writer, which quite often writers don't, if they're sort of newer writers, then, then you just hand that over and then you get to see it, you know. And it can be very difficult. Yeah, I've had that experience of going to see something I, and I literally didn't even understand what I was watching for about five minutes because it was so because mm. I've had no involvement in that side at all. Amazing. Um, so, so Dom, just that point of so when you when when as a producer you're handed the script, what you could describe the process of kind of you break it down, trying to figure out how you actually make it mechanically. You know, it's 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 you know you've just had a very very tough process of doing that and. Um, Kind of what's what's the first thing that goes through your head when someone hands in a script to say, look? Get... Well, I think with the f- film that I've just made, Bull, uh, a lot of the work was already done because um, it was written by a very well-respected filmmaker called Paul Andrew Williams, and he had had some success um, previously with films like um, London to Brighton was his first film that he made for like sixty thousand pounds in two thousand and five or something, um, <clears throat> and then he's done films like Song for Marion with Vanessa Redgrave and and. Um, more lately on TV, but he's a very experienced writer. So uh, it, it wasn't like he, uh, 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 it was being handed a script from someone who's not very good at script writing. He is a very good script writer. So yeah, but that kind of makes it harder if you've got to take something that's very well articulated and polished and, and actually try and mechanically get it on camera. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we didn't, we developed it, it was pretty developed already. Yeah. We, we worked on it a little bit. It was, a, it was an odd structure with Bull because it's a non-linear story that flashes back from 10 years before, which... Uh, in reading was sometimes a bit confusing um, so we literally had to do like an EP pass like a, a pass for the executive producers because and I, I don't want to talk too much about it because you haven't seen it yet and no, th- it's, there, it's there is th- I don't want to give it away basically but there was one executive in America who didn't get it didn't get until I had to and she came back with all these notes uh, and I just stopped her and I said can I just say one thing and I said what it is and then she, there was a pause at the end and she went okay I love it even more now but because the script wasn't wasn't necessarily that clear so we had to really make it black and white in terms of when we're in the past when when we're in the present which didn't translate onto the screen although it was a fight with the executives because they literally wanted us to put 10 years ago (laughs) present day 10 years ago and they're like no if it's confusing it's okay you get there in the end and he the director was very keen on on people having to work quite hard for it and not giving people any an easy ride so they that that was um that was a challenge just to try and make sure that we and we fought me and Paul to not do that and we I think we won that well we won the battle in the sense that we didn't have to do it but people do come out of the cinema thinking I was a bit confused about at that moment but then he said do you get it by the end got it by the end well that's fine as long as you got it by the end yeah, yeah. Um, but I think with Bullet it was fairly because we knew the budget was going to be very small we didn't think it was going to be too much of a challenge to, to get together and because it was Paul Andrew Williams um, it wasn't too hard to, to put together yeah. in the end. If it had been a first-time writer with an unproven record, it would have been a hell of a lot harder. Yeah. And but but was it was, so was it very clear on page that that you know kind of uh, he thought about how to stage it, how to shoot it on budget? Yeah, I mean, or, or did you, is that sort of conversation that you had to iterate? No, through? he yeah he always. I mean, he's a writer director, so in that sense, when he's writing, he's writing how he's going to direct it, yeah. which which in a way is very helpful because he kind of he can. Ad- adjust and adapt on set that day as opposed to having to sometimes hold on we to call up get the writer in can we change this line can we change that he could just make those decisions which actually the flip side to that was that he would just sort of add lines that hadn't gone through clearance and hadn't gone through copyright so he was suddenly throwing in Alanis Morissette references and I was like whoa whoa wait a minute because the script has to go through this process where everything goes through copyright to make sure you're not going to get sued by <laughs> by Alanis Morissette for saying something that um <clears throat> But he, he was, it was, it's a joy to work with the writer. I like working with writer directors because of that, because he writes very visually. And when he starts talking about it at script stage, he already knows how he's going to shoot mm-hmm. it. Um, uh, the flip side is that it would be very interesting to see another director's interpretation of that, of that work yeah. as well. But they're both yeah. uh, equally valid. From yeah, and it's interesting that, that, that idea of protecting something from from the rest of, or, or trying to trying to protect the, the essence of something. Are you aware of that as a producer? Is there ever, ever any conflict about I, I kind of th- the darlings that come through in the script that have to be I mean, I think so. I mean, I, it, you asked me in the previous session what the job of the producer is, and I think the job of the producer is about being a glue for all the different departments to make sure that the ultimate story comes through and having a 
creative flair mixed with a logistical flair mixed with a financial flair but also having a, a very close relationship similar to probably how uh, Jenny is with her, her writers of trust with the writer director to say that this is what I want this is what I'd like to do it and I say look can we try this can you think about not doing that in an abattoir but maybe thinking of it in a butcher's shop because we can afford the but you know <laughs> th those sorts of conversations at, 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 at that level I think that, that comes with trust and I think um, like we did have to fight for the exec I was my first film and I didn't really want to piss anybody off least of all the executives in America who, who, who were financing it. So, but I was literally saying no to, to, to request because actually I, I owed that to Paul because I'd gone on this journey to Paul and say, this is how it should be. And I probably burned a few bridges for, for those people. But I think in the end, I was quite pleased I did because mm -hmm. um, I fought the corner on Paul's behalf and I think the film is better as a result, mm -hmm. even if they might not work for me again. <laughs> and, 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 and Simon, when you're writing a character or a setting, do, does the idea of budget ever go through your head or is that something that you leave to one side and then that, I mean, it's, it's again like coming, figuring out whether you figure that character out then or leave it for later. Is that, how early does that idea come into your head? I don't think I really think about them. I mean, obviously, you know, you have to think, I mean, you think of it a bit. I mean, you can't be kind of just jumping from country to country, but usually... By the time that's you got to bond, that... That's what a Bond film does. <laughs> yeah, well, unless you're Bond. But, um... You know, usually the parameters of it are broadly set. You know, you have a kind of world and some characters. I must say I don't think too much about the budget, right. but I quite like things that are close yeah. up with characters. Sometimes just being in a confined space with characters, which is the cheapest thing you can do, can be fantastic. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't do it all like that. But yeah, no, I don't. And, and then, then, you, then you get into production and, they st and you start going like, well... You can't do all this. There's too many of these short scenes, and they're saying, "But this seems really vital." Mm -hmm. When you're going to lose thirty, you know. So then you have those painful mm -hmm. conversations, but mm -hmm. they kind of creep up on you, and you think you're fine, and you're home and dry, and then they suddenly say, "No, you're going to lose thirty scenes." So it's kind of as the closer you get to the shoot, mm -hmm. the more the reality comes in, you know. Yeah. And Je and Jenny, you know, how much of process? Obviously, you you produced on set, and how much of process comes into your conversation when you're building stories and worlds and well, I, I try not to, I and mean, I'm always thinking about it, but I try not to say that, because I think actually when you're coming up with the idea, the last thing you want to hear is, we can't do that, we'll never be able to no, do that, we'll never be able true. to do that. Because it's better to just let it, because it probably won't even happen being, and occasionally I have done that, and you know, and, and then I've thought, no, no, just sort of step back and wait till, wait till it's, it's finished. Um, but I mean, when we worked on Fleabag, that was a tiny, tiny budget. But sometimes I think actually it's quite good having a tiny budget, because it actually mm. makes you, so creative at the beginning you've got to think it you and as you say sometimes like a two-hander in a, in a room which is one of the you know cheapest things you can film actually can be the most powerful thing so, so sometimes if you've got all the money in the world it it it, it makes it not not bond because actually that isn't all the money in the world because they have to do so mm. you know they have to use it in so many ways with stunts and everything else but with other shows you know if we if we'd made fleabag entirely in america we would have had well, I mean, we would have had 10 times the amount of money we had, but I don't know what we would have done with that. I think yeah. that could have actually, would have made it harder in some ways yeah. rather than easier. I, mean, I, I, I have a suspicion that's what makes British drama so good, is mm. everybody's been schooled in that, in that environment where you have to put the characters first. And also because the actors are so good, actually, if you don't do that, then you're going to end up with, with something that doesn't play. Um, but, but uh, and... Don, was it clear in t when you cast Bull? Was it, w you know for you how you know you're, you're an actor performer? How did you see the process of casting? Because that must be quite an interesting thing for you to go through that process. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I am I am an actor, and I I <coughs> trained as an actor. I still am acting, but I'm sort of transitioning to production. I've sort of run two careers at once, which is quite fun and challenging in many ways. Um, but it's been really really great being on the other side of the table, from conception of pieces to writing them to uh, working on them with writers, to directors' passes, to casting, and seeing just how small a part the actor actually is in all of this. And it, it's given me a huge appreciation for when an actor turns up on set and questions a line, and they, they have no idea the yeah. type of work and the hours of conversations that's gone in about that line and, and uh, previously, and what, how many execs have had an opinion over that line already, or whatever. The actor goes, oh, I think we should do it like this. And the director goes, yes, okay, yes. But let's do one your way, and then we'll do one my way, and then his way, and <laughs> the director's way gets chosen. Um, but it's certainly been, it's been a, it, it was, in terms of casting Bull, yeah, I mean, 
we were lucky because we didn't have to, we weren't bound by having to get a bankable star because the budget was, it was a low budget British indie. Um, so we could, we were, we could cast the right people in the, in the roles and as a result we've got fantastic performances. As a result, we, the sales agent were, was pushing people our way that were bankable and as soon as you start doing that, you're, you're diluting it and, and it's not, we would have had people we would have worked with but wouldn't have been as good as yeah. what we got in the end. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's as an, uh, you know, uh, explaining what a sales agent is could take all night, but, but it, I mean, we talked before about how many people are involved in the process. Um, Simon, when, you, when you're sort of conjuring characters out of your imagination, do, does it help to have an actor in mind? Or do, have you been in that situation where you think, I've got to make this fit for a particular performance? Or do, do, you, do you think, uh, you know, I'll, 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 I'll make them fold into what I'm trying to achieve? Um, you mean at an early stage? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I have tried that if I've got a bit stuck. I've kind of thought like, oh, well, I kind of cast this in my mind. It's in a way you're trying to find a shortcut to solve problems with the character. And I haven't found that as that successful, really, because you end up writing a version of a character they've played before, yeah. in a way, rather than the actor. So, But I, I, I guess in EastEnders, you already know who the performer is going to be. Oh, so, no, in so you, How do you appropriate that voice, or is that something that... Oh, Simon created a lot of the characters on EastEnders, or on, on the recent... I mean, there were, there were people that you created. Yeah, I mean, you kind of... Sometimes you, like... I mean, it, again, this, the thing about EastEnders is, it's like, it's a massive scale. So, yeah. like... If you can tell a story about a character, you could do half an hour in a character's life, the, the audience has been watching for 25 years, and it could be their death. So that's quite a thing yeah. to do, really. You know, to, people have been invested and follow this character. Or you can get an idea for a story about one character that's in it, and then build a whole new family, bring them in and tell the story yeah. over two years. So then you can invent characters. I mean, if you're just appropriating the characters are there, yeah, you just hear them. I mean, it's kind of easy, really. I mean, it really is. The, the yeah. characters served up for you. They are yeah. who they are. Yeah. And then you just kind of like, they kind of write themselves. I mean, it's, that's quite easy. It's much harder to make up a character. And I think, in the end, I think with making up characters for me, I've just, I've tried all kinds of things, but I think it's almost just getting a feel for them. Yeah. I mean, literally, all the other stuff, like you're trying to visualise, I mean, I just think just try and get a feel for them and hear them and then just let go a bit. Whenever I try and control it, it doesn't work out that well. Yeah. If I just kind of, get a feel of who they are and then just like let them say what they want, it kind of works better. Mm. Well, it's, it, that's what's so extraordinary when someone has a voice and gives voice to characters. I mean, for me, that's one of the most incredible things. Um, but you, we, we, you were saying very uh, interestingly about the difference between a novelist and your interest in photography. But it, I mean, the, the, the challenge of having 300 people show up to, to basically perform your, or, or, or support your, the words you have on the page, do you, do you, um, how, how does that feel? And how, do, you know, how do you personally try to make sure that what your, your voice sticks as long as you... Well, I mean, as, as Jane, it's a long process, yeah. you know, it's kind of, as soon as it's green lit, you're kind of off then, because then you've got to, you've got to find people to make this. So obviously there's some big decisions, like the producer is absolutely pivotal in that. The director, whoever the director is, so you, you basically have to look at directors' work, Talk to directors, try and get a sense of who they are. Are you going to mesh? Are they the right person? Are they available? Suddenly it becomes a whole lot of questions to answer. And it's not just get the right one. It's like, can you afford them? Are they available? Are they interested? And then, it, so there's all that process, pre-production. Then you get into costume and music and makeup and the set design. And it becomes completely consuming because you assume that what is in your head and everyone's discussed is going to happen. But you can actually mm. suddenly get something and come back and it's completely wrong. Mm. And that, that can absolutely have a massive effect, like the des design of a house or something can have a massive mm. effect because that's all about that character. Mm. So it's literally, you have to be kind of over everything to some extent. It's not just you, obviously. You're working with other producers and directors and a whole team. And that goes right through to the edit. But in terms of the writing, to be honest, you don't really think about all those people. And you, it's only when you go on set, which you don't do a lot, or I don't really do a lot, when you go on set, you suddenly think, oh my God, there's all these <laughs> people. And you're the only person who's got nothing to do, really. You're kind of like everyone's handing you headphones and a chair and a cup of coffee, but you're just sitting at the back, you know, and yeah. I'm not sure anyone really wants you there, but you're just there, you know. And everyone else is really busy and has got a job and everyone's got to be really... So it's kind of bizarre because you forget about all of that. 
you know, you're just writing and you're talking with the producer or something, and then suddenly there's all these people, mm. and yet you're not really that active in that in that mm. role. So it's kind of odd. Yeah, you can say that again. Um, so, but um, going back to the voice, Jenny. So, so, so working with somebody who has kind of a really authentic voice like Phoebe, uh, you know, how, the, wrestling with the dilemma of how different to make things tonally uh, as a storyteller for her and for you. Is, is that something that you have to deal with her voice a lot in terms of thinking about curating that or addressing that? You know, because obviously Fleabag is one of the great authentic pieces of, 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 of sort of storytelling of the last 10 years. And, um, you know, kind of re either repeating that or doing something new. That, that, do, do you ever discuss that or is that, does it come from somewhere very different? Do you mean, do, do we discuss it in terms of we mustn't do another flea bag or do you... Well, no, but just, just in terms of, I mean, I guess it's sort of pigeonholed in question is, 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 you know, kind of that authenticity of voice is, you know, how is it, is, it, is that to apply to, you know, kind of whether it's a huge blockbuster film or, or, or her, you know, kind of the next closest held personal project? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, she has got a very, she has got a very distinctive voice and that was... And that that has led her to, and made her realise, and us realise, that the best thing that she can always do is just write her her own things. Because right. actually, um, Killing Eve was something that other writers wrote on, and actually that became impossible because she's got a very distinctive voice, and you can't. You know, yeah. So she overwrote it as 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 they do, sort of the American system that the, the creator will write on top of another writer's work. But there was no one no one else's voice who came anywhere close to her. Not not that they were worse, or better, they just didn't sound the same, yeah. you know, it didn't match up. So she is very much will only write her, her own things. Um, and that and that's fine. But I don't think she ever thinks about I mean she's you know, she's always got the next idea. She's always yeah. got something bubbling along and obviously she goes out of her way very much to not tell the same story twice and, and neither of us very, are very good at going back and doing second series we've both got a sort of thing it's like never do a second series apart from Fleabag which yeah. she did do but um, on the whole I think she likes to move on to the next thing and come up with the next idea and then and then throw that into it but it always will have her voice and it will always have that humour you know she will never do anything however dramatic and dark mm. it is I'm sure it will always have the, the humour because that's just how she sort of sees the world um, mm. yeah very good and so uh, I'm going to pivot really to, 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 to you know, get a lot of people here might be interested in getting into storytelling and, and, you know, we had a question earlier about, you know, kind of how, how do I get material seen? What, so, um, you know, if some, Don, someone comes to you with an idea, um, what, what, you know, kind of, you know, we talked about your development fund, but, but um, kind of what, what persuades persuade you in material? Um, I think from my... Uh, I, what I didn't realise when I started working out um, as a producer and developing it is just how really that's te how technical a film script mm. is. Um, and someone showed me a book uh, called Sid Field, the Sid Field Beats, which are quite sort of very well known in Hollywood, <laughs> which basically you can break down uh, pretty much 90% of film scripts into the Sid Field Beats. It's a really good place to start, where it's it just a series of like eight to ten beats of the beginning um, and then by page, literally of a 90 page script, for example, uh, bearing in mind it's sort of one minute per page, so 90 minute film equals a 90 page script, where by page 12 there's the inciting incident, the, the, the thing that happens that, that is going to set the course, like the detective meets the, her, her partner on a case or something, and then by page 20 it's the end of that one, something shocking happens, and then, then there's a pinch point. It, it really, really useful points. And someone sh said something frightening to me was that if you if those beats aren't in place, yeah. then an executive probably won't read beyond page yeah. twenty. They so it's, it's, page it's 20. interesting that in your first project you, you chose to throw all those things up into, yeah. <laughs> into a nonlinear show. But Exa exactly, exactly. Although it still does actually, funnily yeah. enough, despite the, the jumping, it still yeah. does have its exciting right, right, right. incident. It's climaxed by page forty five, and then the the um, end of Act three, and then the conclusion. It does actually still follow that. Yeah. But um, someone said to me that if those aren't in, then executives won't, they're so busy, they've got so many scripts to read that they like to know that by page 25, 30, it, they know which way it's going. And I don't know how true that is, but it's... That's, that's like saying something's got to happen, isn't it? Really? Yeah, I there's got to be compelling been... enough, it's got to be interesting and engaging enough that by that point that you've met interesting characters, a compelling story that makes me want to read on further and further, more and more. And you'd be surprised that when you, when I have that technical... Uh, um, 
knowledge in my brain it does separate the, the sort of the good the really good scripts from the not so so good script mm -hmm. because it's the ones that grab you instantly that make you want to read until page 90 on, on features don't know whether that's the same for tv or not i think it's uh, yeah i think that yeah and i i, I know that it's superfield it's one of the first things you read super yeah. and actually it's and everyone else has followed after superfield but he did nail quite a few things mm -hmm. actually about yeah. structure which are just basic Truths, but it's I a good starting point for it's a good time. starting point and I think just basic act structure as well but um I think yeah I think what is more what I think is more and more important because I've done development scripts in the past that you know have nearly got made and haven't and often like the, the, the openings are quite kind of like languorous so I'm taking my time I'm feeling my way into the stories but the thing I've just done is an adaptation and the beginning of the book is really fantastic and that's the beginning of the show and it's got a really good opening. And I do think actually openings are really, mm. really important. You actually mm. can't mess around. Mm. You need to have that, on the script, you need to have the audience really intrigued or fascinated or loving the character within five pages, really. Mm. You need to be there at the beginning. So you need to come in a bit later into the story than you think, really. But you think, uh, particularly if it's like a thriller, or like, if it's like, yeah. you need to have within the first 15 pages something that is really saying what the genre is, or saying, or if it's a horror, saying what the genre is. In a drama, you probably can afford a bit more space, no, potentially, you, or do you think even with you, a drama... No, you absolutely you, can, but I think what's interesting, like this thing I've just, this adaptation, it starts off with this woman walking down this really nice leafy street in South London, she's kind of beautiful, she's got two kids, she's got a nice job, husband, beautiful house, she goes... She sees these removal men further up the street, and she, she's wondering, she's obsessed with property prices, all obsessed with property prices, and she wonders who's moving, and then she kind of lets them go past, and they go up her drive, and she follows them up to the front door, and she says, what are you doing? And they kind of, and then this woman comes out, and she has a conversation with them, at which point she said, she said, what are you doing in this house? And she said, um, well, you just bought it. And she goes in the house, finds everything gone. <laughs> <laughs> she, all the things are gone, her kids have disappeared, her husband. So it's like a good That's opening. That's an incredible It's like opinion. a really good opening. And it is kind of thrillery in a way, but actually it's really made me think, like, just get in there with the story. <laughs> get in there. And then once you've got them, then you can you can do what you want. Mm. So, I mean, I'm not saying that's brilliant. I'm just saying that that, that is kind of what the opening is now and, and kind of is, is pretty much that in the book. And it just is much, much easier because mm. you pick them up quick. And, mm. and I think I've certainly... In the past, I, I did this thing about the Guinness family. I spent about 10 pages. It was like, you know, you're going back in the past. And, and I thought it was really beautiful, but actually the story hadn't really started. Yeah. And you need to get the story started pretty quick. Um, mm -hmm. And, and Je Jenny, so you, um, I mean, talk about mentorship as well. And, you know, kind of really taking kind of voices and... Because and, 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 you've done a fair amount of this, haven't you, with working with new writers. And yeah, yeah. No. What, so what, what, what's that experience about about and what you know kind of what what do people really you know forming those voices and honing that craft is that something that um is hard fought or is that um you know to, 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 is it possible just to be natural at it oh i think definitely i think definitely is possible. And i think that's probably the the best way i, I mean i did I, I worked at the writers academy at the bbc which was which was brilliant and yeah, people had to have written something before they got on it anyway whether it was a, a radio play or a, or a stage play um and then they were sort of taught at, well they got the, but by the end they got the opportunity to write an east end as a casualty a whole being adopted so it was a brilliant opportunity yeah. and they got told a lot of things on the way we were very heavily into into structure um but the people you know the people that were brilliant at the beginning who had the brilliant dialogue and the brilliant characters were the people that were still brilliant at the end they just had some more sort of structural right, right, right. things and i do think i think you can teach the structure and i think the structure is obviously important but i think the natural ability to write and the natural ability to write I don't think you can teach someone to write mm. dialogue and really good characters. Mm. I think that is a, I think that is something that is innate. And I think, and I don't think, I actually don't think you need to know that much about structure because I think the weird thing is that most scripts, anyway, when you read them, will fall into that structure because that's just the, you know, that is the structure that has been around, as you said, for centuries. Yeah. But I think what the danger is is if people put too much emphasis on the structure, which it, which did used to happen at the Writers' Academy because they got it, it was <laughs> droned and you know put into their heads so much that then they got quite panicky if they hadn't got something happening by page twelve and stuff, and then they sort of retrofit. <laughs> those beats and that doesn't work because yeah. then it sort of stands well, out so, so no, um, we, we're going to just uh, um, I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll we're, but if we can grab some other questions from online if there are any but um, uh, so tips and tricks 
So uh, Richard Curtis said something really interesting because he's famous for really revising his, and he obviously, he managed to keep a sort of freshness. And he said, whenever he makes himself laugh when he's writing a script, he highlights that thing and he never, ever changes that. Uh, is there anything, any sort of craft tricks like that so that when you go through 15 drafts, you don't end up throwing things away that you... How, how do you keep that, that um, uh, 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 sort of objective, this is brilliant thing... Or, or, you know, kind of guess, second guessing in editing. Yeah. I mean, I always have this thing, like, like a working document, which is very free to start with, and I write down, what, what's the essence? I make myself answer, like, ten questions. What's the essence of it? What does the character mm -hmm. want? So if I ever get lost, I go back and check that, because that was right at the beginning. But I guess for me, it's things like, it's often the images. Like, I always think of, like, telling a, t a, t a, 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 a story on TV or film in terms of, like, like ten photographs on a wall, in a way. But like if you had no dialogue, would those ten images tell the story? Yeah. And in a way, that is the story. Those ten images building through it to a really powerful image that tells you everything about that. It's like a Raymond Carver story. He's a really great short story writer. It always builds to the final image, and then you understand everything. Yes. So I always think of that as like those ten images. What are the, and I will literally write down ten images at some point before I start writing, and that's what you're building to yeah. because it's visual and that's. That's for me, I, that, and that's something I hold on to. And then I wouldn't get rid of one of those in a second or something better. Do you stick those around at your office as well? I mean, do you keep those images? So they're all pictures see? of me, actually. They're pictures of me or my name. No, no, no. They're, they're not actually. I mean, they're images oh, okay, so like. There might be. Head. They're an image from the story right. that you come up with. So it'll be like. Oh, right, I see. Not it'll be just a, a one line description. I mean, I see it in my head, but I haven't got the actual. The actual I haven't got the actual image. physical image, but um, it'll mm. literally be a list of 10. Ten short sentences. So, so Jenny, what is a story hornet? Please. Like, like, just... well, that, that all comes because of, <laughs> I don't know really, but there was a, quite a lot of feedback was written at um, my house because <laughs> it was getting very, very late in every sense of the word. I mean, it was sort of four in the morning, and we were, you know, Phoebe basically moved in for a couple of weeks to do quite a lot of writing, and there was some problem that we hit. But I don't know for some reason on my house, which has never had hornets before or since. <laughs> had an enormous hornet just appeared and Phoebe was absolutely terrified of it. And anyway, we spent a long time getting this hornet out. Well, she, we were in the middle of a terrible crisis so she didn't know where she was going to go with this particular episode of Fleabag. And then this hornet came, so we stopped thinking about that and we were chasing it out. Anyway, we got rid of it and then decided we could do no more that night and she was going to go to bed. And then she'd just gone to bed, it was at four in the morning and I heard this very quiet voice going, Jenny, it's back. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in my room. <laughs> and so I went to the room and this enormous thing within the room so anyway we had and I was terribly brave and we finally got rid of it and then suddenly she worked out <laughs> what what was missing and I can't actually remember what I haven't asked for what moment that wasn't feedback and it's all become a box? terrible blur it was in the box but it's all become a terrible blur but um but anyway so from I don't know why but she now calls me have you, have you got a badge that says story I, I should have it should yeah. be my it should be my hashtag or something um, on Twitter so, so here, I mean, there are some questions from the audience which I'm going to uh, run through, but it, um, if we've got time. But uh, does anybody in the audience want to have, uh, ask any questions particularly? Go for it. Um, so when you're writing um, a, a film, usually they are about an hour and a half long, but then you have films like Tarantino films, which are often like two and a half hours long. But then when you're writing a television show, they're often limited to about an hour. Do you ever find yourself strained to fit every detail in one episode? De for me, definitely. I mean, I, I always, I got slightly better, I always write episodes really long. I mean, when I started, I used to write, if it was 60 minutes, I'd write 100 pages. Because I just wouldn't, I want to basically get it alive and get it feeling right. And then I, would, then I would, it's like you're doing something creative and just getting it on the page and then you become your own editor and go through and cut it out. But yeah, it is, it is harder. But weirdly, with, um, Netflix and streamers, there's more flexibility about the length of episode. Where in TV, mm. it used to be like to the second. You know, you're having painful conversations about whittling it down. But yeah, for me, it's always difficult to get it in. But I think what's good about that is you have to condense and condense and condense, and it ends up being really good because it's so, there's no, no waste. And, but yeah, and, I think it's And awesome. TV consumes a huge amount of story as well, doesn't it? And yeah, definitely. Um, any, any other questions? writer and you've written a script how on earth do you get it read I mean do you submit it to an agent or do you find a friend who knows what they're doing and give it to Don 
or how do you, how do you, how do you get a script read? That's a really good question. Yeah. Very good question. Yeah, I mean, it's I think it's trickier now. Definitely, there used to be. A, a, I mean, agents. I do think agents do still read um, scripts. If you, but I think it would help if you had an in to the agent. I think coming in as without ever having done anything or had mm. any radio or play or something. I think if you've if you've managed to produce something like a like in a different medium, it's a lot easier. The BBC used to read everything. I mean, they used to everything that got sent in got read. But I'm sure that doesn't mm. happen anymore. No, it's very, it's very difficult. I mean, so many of the production companies will say, we will not read unsolicited scripts. They will only take accept scripts from agents or from publishers. Or, or um, uh, I suppose you just need to find a producer who might... I suppose it's so com it's so competitive as well that, that there are a lot of scripts to read. Everyone's got a lot of scripts to read. But why you need to have a reason to sit down and spend an hour yeah. to read this yeah. script out of your you know, people's busy days or whatever, it's... It's really difficult. It's that's why the ma magic happens. Suddenly, one lands on someone's there, desk. There and are new writers' it, competitions as well. Various, mm -hmm. um, quite a few actually now. Um, production companies run new writers' competitions where they look literally for brand new writers who've never had anything done. I know Red Planet does one. I know several, several. I think that, I think all of that is absolutely true. But the other thing is, everyone is desperate for a new mm. voice and a new script. And also, I think when you when you try to get into television, it just seems impossible. And then when you go to him, if you found that, you will assume it's full of geniuses, that like everyone's <laughs> going to be a genius. Like, and actually, there's lots of people who aren't that great who make a living at it. So it's not impossible. No. It really isn't. I mean, it's tough to get in, but I think... Well, and, yeah. and certainly the continuing series, like the EastEnders and everything, they're always looking for new voices, aren't they? I mean, because they just Absolutely, get through so yeah. many writers. No, totally, yeah. yeah. But, but also, I think there's... Uh, you know, we've been, we had a really interesting discussion that there's a... You know, it, it, being on a film crew used to be a close shop, and now it's voracious. If you if you want to do it, there's there's channels. It's not it's not that difficult if you if you know how to approach the right people, right into screen skills and all that sort of thing. But but that voice thing is really really critical because there are lots of ways of expressing your voice, whether it's in theatre, whether it's you know kind of it, it, if there's a way of articulating that voice. I think I think actually the, strangely enough, the agents are always looking for voices, but not. But not on the page. Yeah. Um, and also now the more writers' rooms that they do here, that we've become sort of more like the American yeah. system, that they take a, a huge number of writers, yeah. where, where you have an opportunity to write on something that you, or be in the room for something that you might not end up writing an episode, or your episode might be overwritten by somebody else, but you get the experience yeah. of, of doing it. And I do think people are all the TV, um, everybody is more keen to take a risk on a new voice now than they were when I started, when it was like five or six names were the only people that would ever get. The BBC or ITV to sort of sign up to doing it. But uh, I think also the, probably the other way is to is to ask for mentorship. If, uh, you know, there are people you admire. You know, there's, there's an opportunity to write to them and say, you know, I really like your work. Can you? Is there any chance you can you can look at my stuff and and you know if you that that that's a the time honoured tradition of sort of the way that you know a lot of people come through. Um, listen, we're, good, we're I know time is 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 very precious tonight. So. Um, I want to first of all thank the Borlays uh, uh, tech team for running an incredibly uh, proficient and excellent uh, thing in quite tricky circumstances, but also thank you to Simon Ashdown, Jenny Robbins, and uh, Dom Tai. Please say thank you to all. <laughs>